Hi, welcome back to the Tegra YouTube channel. As you can see, we've got an abundance of parts on the floor. We've got a Mark 7 Golf GTI behind us, and we've got Rob Baker, the owner of Area Motorsport with us today. And I'm going to pass it over and he's going to tell you what we're doing. Okay, so, big load of parts. Um, we've got a Performance Pack 2013 Mark 7 GTI. Um, it's done 104,000 miles. And we're basically going to turn it into a track car um, to show what the cars are capable of. So, in terms of the car itself, they're a good platform, a standard, great on the road. Um, there's a lot of stuff now available for them. They've been around nine or ten years. Um, last year we did one the same as this, tested a load of parts, spring rates on the coilovers, what parts work, what parts don't work. That car's now become a race car, which is what normally happens with my cars. We start them as thinking they're track cars and they end up turning into race cars. So we're going to do the same again with what parts we've tried and tested, um, but we're going to document it this time, um, which I certainly don't have time to do, but <laughs> you guys do. First thing we're going to do is basically chassis and brakes. Um, really important for a track car. If anyone's ever been on track with standard brakes, they last about three laps if you're pushing. Um, very wallowy, lots of body roll, and we want to get rid of all of that while still keeping the car compliant on the road. Um, when we did this previously, same components roughly that are here, we took that car to the Nürburgring, which is historically bouncy and bumpy. Um, obviously we drove it from here to there, which was a good 10, 11 hour drive. Um, car was still comfy on the motorways, back roads and, and everything. So we don't want to just chuck stuff on and make it um, uncomfortable on the road. The, the whole purpose of this is to create a car where if this is your only car and you haven't got a second one, it's still usable daily, but you can go to the track, pound round all day and not have any issues. Component wise, we've got a lot laid out. So some of the stuff here, the HPA stuff is like for further down the line in the video. Um, HPA are a company who actually try and test their products on their own track car in Canada. Um, so we're really excited to give their products a go. We've got a turbo intercooler, we've got a downpipe down here um, and we're going to basically, after this first video of the, you know, the basic stuff, brakes and chassis, we're going to up the power with their parts and get some data and, and see how it goes. Um, suspension wise, so what we're doing first, like I said, chassis and brakes, we've got yellow speed coilovers. Now these are the DPS coilovers, so they're like the standard ones that Yellow Speed do. All we've done is change the spring rates. Um, we've worked with you guys at Tagiwa and Yellow Speed for ages now, and it's brilliant that we make some suggestions after we try and test products and they listen and change a few things, and that's where we've ended up. So these are a really good product. You know, a lot of the KWs and coilovers like that on the market, they're two and a half grand plus. They don't come with adjustable top mount, so you're still at the same camber unless you buy some that fit it. Um, these are just over 800 pounds. They ride great on the road, they're brilliant on track. This is exactly what we went to the Nürburgring on. Um, they come with the standard adjustable top mounts. So you can get roughly about three degrees when you're at the ride height that we want to run them at. Um, can't really be beaten for the cost in terms of what they give you. They also come with adjustable drop links, which again, we've got these on our race cars, exactly the same ones, yellow speed ones. So as you can imagine, they've been hit over curbs many, many times. Um, we've got no play in them still after a long time of using one of the cars. Um, so it's great, they come with it, they're no extra, and they come with the coilovers. Um, Rear drop links as well we're here. So one thing that's not here, we're going to use a hard race rear anti-roll bar. It's 25.4 millimeters. Again, it's what we used last year when we made our first track car. Worked really well. We did try a few other variants, but we found that one the best, so that's what we've stuck with. Um, we do have adjustable drop links, which are quite important to ensure you've not got any preload on the roll bar um, when you do your setup. So they're white line items. Um, we've got Powerflex, so these are for the inner swing arms. Um, they're both eccentric bolts as standard and they rust and corrode and make adjustment extremely hard. Because we're using adjustable hard race toe arms and camber arms, it means that 
we don't really need the adjustment in the eccentric bolts anymore. So we'll fit these items. Again, they're good on the road. You don't notice any extra road noise or compliance issues over bumps or anything. They just ensure everything's not moving in ways you don't want it to with the standard rubber ones that, especially on this car that's in 100,000 miles, is quite old now. Front arms, we've got Vertcline ones. Now a lot of people will be thinking, why are we going straight to Vertcline arms? These are what we use on the race car. There's a few bits of the components that aren't here. Um, they are spherical. And the reason we're going straight to these is because the aluminium arms that are on the market that uh, are over 500 pounds for the likes of Super Pro ones. Obviously you get new bushes and it, 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 they work fine but they don't really gain anything over the standard arm other than a bit of weight loss. Um, you know, the, they do say that they add a bit of caster and stuff, but through measuring it's minimal. It's certainly nothing you'd ever notice. Um, for the purpose of what we're doing, we are gonna set these up at the standard arm lengths. So, you know, if you don't buy these, which are an expensive item, they're about 900 pounds, um, and you just do the front arm bushes, the car's gonna drive the same apart from a slight bit of indifference in the roll center it's going to drive the same with or without these of what we're doing on the first track day that we're doing which is like you know the basic track stuff that you can use every day and and go on track with so that's those um just mentioned these earlier but these are the hard race camber arms you got the hard race toe arms these are the hardened rubber ones they do do spherical as well um, which is what we use on the race cars, but we tested the rubber ones. Um, we did a lot of laps around Nürburgring track days and stuff. There was no play in them. They're actually our spares for racing now. They've come off that car that is now a race car. Um, and it's little things like other brands. This is a left and right hand thread, so you can adjust it with it bolted to the hub. A lot of other brands just stick a rose joint here and it means you have to unbolt it to adjust the camber. Obviously your hub drops down, you have to wind it out, bolt it all back together, measure it. If you're not quite right, do the same again. These are very simple, um, left and right hand thread. Makes adjustment really easy. Um, suspension wise, I think we've covered everything. We'll get a dog bone insert in there. Um, not sure which dog bone variant in terms of the rubber bush on the subframes on this car. Um, so when we get it up in the air, we'll get the right one because there's, there's two different types. But yeah, aside from chassis stuff, I think we've touched on everything there. So brakes, we are using Yellow Speed 330 mil kit. Um, again, these retail, I think they're about 1400 pounds. So far cheaper than the likes of the AP kits and stuff. Now we've used these in endurance racing um, for quite a number of years on our Civics, which are only 150 kilos lighter. Um, we also used these on our Golf before it became a race car and we had zero issue with, issues with them. The only reason we changed is because the pad size is 17 mil and on the race cars we've got a 25 mil thick pad now because they do endurance racing. We wanted that extra pad depth in case you know, they, they run down too quickly. So that's the main reason we changed. So they're a really good solution. Um, we're going to run them with Paget. RSL 1s or RS 29s to start with. Um, 356mm disc, again replacement rotors are about £450, so far cheaper than the majority of kits out there, um, but they do last ages. I don't think, we we certainly never change the discs after probably six or seven track days and a trip to the Nürburgring on the old car. Um, I think we did one set of pads, so they hold up really well. Um, we've got your standard braided lines, Hell ones, um, simple. They'll replace the, replace the, uh, the rubber ones. And then we've got EBC Orange stuff rear pads. Now, um, I know some people aren't a fan of EBC, but the reason we use these is they're a really hard pad and it keeps the balance correct for the ABS. So if you put a soft pad in, it's forever trying to stop the rear brakes from locking. Um, so we went through a few different variants and this is what we ended up with. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be these pads, but as long as they're a hard pad and not something that's soft like a DST500 or a road pad, your ABS, your brake balance will be correct basically. 
The only other important thing when you're using these on track, especially with sticky tyres, again, we've not got the wheels and tyres here for this, but we've got a set of PS4S, which we're going to run on it, which is what a lot of people choose as a decent road tyre. Don't need to take spare wheels to the track because they're decent in the dry and they're decent in the rain as well. And then we've got a set of um, AO52s, which is what we run on the race car. So we're gonna, we know the AO52s will be quicker, but we want to show that the components with both tyres, so on the day we're doing in a few weeks time, we'll run both sets of tyres. Um, an important thing to have with sticky tyres is some sort of catch can system to get rid of the standard PCV. So if you've ever seen a car without one of these fitted um, with an EA888 engine, the plumes of smoke come out the exhaust. Um, not great for the engine, you'll probably get black flagged on track as well. Um, so this negates that, it acts as a catch can as well as negating that issue as well. So this is pretty essential. On PS4S's or something like that you might get away without one, but certainly any sort of performance semi-slick or something that's a bit up on grip level from PS4S's, you're probably going to need one of these and want one of these on your car. So that pretty much goes through everything we're fitting to begin with. After that day, obviously we're going to go through everything, analyse everything, and then we're going to up the power and some of the components. In fact, all the components from HPA are going to get fitted to the car. So at the moment, um, TI Motorsport have mapped this car on the dyno right behind you. Um, this is just a stock IS20 turbo there is no modifications to it at all. Um, roughly 300 horsepower is a stock map, which I'm pretty happy with for the mileage it's done. We do have a exhaust we're going to fit to it as well, which we've got off a previous car. It's a Scorpion one. Um, we use the Scorpion ones because noise is really good. It, it ups the noise level, but perfectly manageable on the road. You know, on the motorways, it's pretty silent. Put your foot down, it's a bit of noise. Um, a lot of them are too loud for day-to-day -day driving and they do do a resonated and unresonated version so you can have it louder if you want but we use the resonated one. Um, other bits we've got here so what we're going to do after the first day is we have all these parts from HPA so really appreciate them providing them to us. Um, we've got this intercooler which we on the race cars run a stock intercooler and the reason we do that is because coolant temps go through the roof. The cars have got CF CSF radiators on them and because they're doing endurance racing, two hour races, tucked up behind cars constantly, which you're not necessarily always on a track day, um, but in a racing environment you are. Um, we tried another brand of intercooler, like it was a Mishimoto one. Um, coolant temps went through the roof. Um, so we went back to a standard one, which for the power level our race cars are running, which are about 300 brake, it's perfectly fine. If you want to go higher than that, which is what we're going to do with this car to see what, we're cap you know, what it's capable of with more power, you really want to upgrade your intercooler. This one is a totally different design to all the other intercoolers on the market pretty much. If you, if you actually look closely at all the others, whether it's an AirTech, Mishimoto or whatever it is, Great on the road, great for tra drag, you know, drag pulls, which a lot of people do with these cars, not so good for track use. This, the way it's designed, allows much more airflow through, um, through the core than those up other upgraded intercoolers do. So we're going to test this. Um, knowing that HPA tests their products is a really good thing for us, because that's what we do before we sell things to people. That's why we're, we're doing this. Um, so we're going to put that on and basically see the coolant temperature changes between the two cars. Um, so looking forward to giving that a go because if it works we'll be putting four of them straight on our four race cars that we've got. We've got here a downpipe. So HPA do a catted downpipe which is what we're going to fit. We haven't got it here um, but we're going to fit one with a sports cat which will be a MOT legal as well so it's not going to cause you any problems at MOT time. Um, all these are relatively similar um, that we've seen, but HPA, again, being a company that deals with motorsport, there's quite a few nice touches on this that aren't on the downpipe. So for starters, you've got this heat shield up by the turbo. 
on the back of the engine there is some sensors and things up at this point um, so they've obviously thought of that put a heat shield on it's the only downpipe I've seen with a heat shield up here and looking at the engine it's it's certainly a good place to have one um, they maintain this bracket which bolts onto the back of the engine again a lot of the aftermarket downpipes don't have this so it's an extra security it's a good thing to have um, and then aside from that it's a three inch bore all the way through um, and it's just you can tell it's something that's been tested on track rather than just made to the sizes that will fit and that's it so it's going to work really well and um, it'll be interesting to see what happens with temps in the engine bay um, but looking forward to giving that giving that a go like I say we'll be using the catted version um, because a lot of people still use their cars on the road so that's what we want to do um, finally we've got racing line oil cooler kit pretty standard they get hot on oil temperature on track for prolonged use um, and this reduces it it's a nicely fitting kit goes on top of the oil filter and replaces it again using four of them on our four race cars that we've got at the moment never causes an issue or a problem all temperatures are well under control um, it does also it mounts on the front um, obviously this is only I think it's a 10 row cooler um, there is more than enough space to add a 16 row if you need to and you can use a Mokul or a C-Trab one and it will bolt straight up so there's no issue if you do need to go larger you can keep all the kit and just buy a larger cooler and it will go straight on Another thing we've got is this, again from HPA, it's a VAD Pro screen, um, it fits in the stock uh, vent, so you remove one of your centre vents, fits straight in there, uh, runs down to the OBD port and gives you every bit of information you could possibly want on track, so obviously we'll get some footage of this when we've got it in the car and working, um, but it's a really important tool, especially when you're doing what we're doing in terms of providing data as well as just bolting bits on um, it's going to show us everything we could possibly want to see finally we've got um, HPA's OEM plus turbo um, which is basically a strengthened IS38 again something that they've um, tried and tested on their own cars in Canada so gives us a lot of confidence that it'll work no problems um, obviously there's a couple of weak points on the stock i38 and these are basically um, stronger bearings a lot of stronger internal parts which means that it will be reliable at whatever power output we decide to go with and it won't be a concern like the stock turbos are um, it's also we haven't got them here but again HPA it comes with all new gaskets it comes with your turbo elbow it, it, it comes with all the parts you require to fit it comes with studs the nuts all new to bolt onto the head um, I'm not sure of many other companies that provide all that stuff so it's it's nice that it's you buy a turbo the actuator is all fitted bolt straight on your car and make a lot more power reliably so first video as explained we're going to do the components we've gone through chassis brakes We've had a, a, what's a stage one map, 300 horsepower. Um, it's not just a generic map. Um, here, they're racers as well. So the car is mapped in terms of power, extremely linear. It's not just got a big kick of torque at the st um, at, at early on in the revs. It, it comes in nice and progressively on our race cars. So we're expecting the same on this with just the stock turbo. Um, after the first day that we're doing, we're obviously going to bolt on the HPA bits, which we've said about. Um, we're then going to go back to the same track. We're going to see what happens with temperatures, because obviously we're probably going to have the best part of 80, 90 horsepower more. Um, we're going to have the HPA intercooler on, so we certainly don't expect intake temps to be a problem. Um, and yeah, we're, we're going to make it a bit more aggressive, basically, for the second one. We don't want to change a vast amount of stuff because we want it to be a a comparable test between the two um, but yeah that's what we'll do on the second one the third one we will make it into what would be classed as a weekend car where it's as aggressive as you'd like it's not going to drive amazingly well on the road 
but it's going to go faster on track. So they're the three days we've got planned. We'll see what happens and document everything data-wise, reliability, and, and go from there.